eventually um, he virtually, you know, he blurted out, yeah, well, of course I had to stop him. He was the most dangerous communist leader outside the, you know, you know USSR. So he, I don't think he did it, uh, did it willingly, but he was a very proud man. He, was, he feels that at the time, and I, I think he's justified in feeling it, at the time there was a, 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 sort of, a, there was a, a, a panic, an international panic. Um, there was a contest between, the co you know, between Russia and, um, and America and the United States um, for um, a dominant role in, in, in Africa. Certainly when the CIA were in taking, you know, taking their seats or going to work in, in, in Southern Africa, um, they felt that they were, they were embarked on a holy war against communism. And he still feels, I think, Ricard, when he was, you know, uh, even in his last days, he felt justified uh, in um, you know, standing up against what he saw, a, a, a Russian menace. I mean, he believed that the Russians wanted the great treasure chest they, you know, of South African mineral wealth. They thought Russia wanted that and a strategic position on the Cape. So he believed he was fighting a good war. When he shot Mandela, he believed he was fighting communism. He wasn't fighting Mandela. He thought he was fighting the Russians. And he still believed it. I mean, he had no personal animosity towards Mandela whatsoever. Uh, and, and certainly admired his, his statesmanship, you know. But at the time, in 1962, there was a, comp you know, a very, very violent um, uh, confrontation, not on the battlefield, but um, elsewhere. And, uh, there was a, you know, a very vigorous contest for influence and for, you know, for dominance in, in, in Africa. I think apologies can be pretty, I think they're pretty easy. I mean, I, I don't think apology, no, I think they should just own up. I mean, say so this is, you know, what, well, this is where we were. This is the context in which we made these decisions. And, it's, you know, it's for us to judge whether it was a, a valid um, action or, you know, it was um, decent or indecent. I learned that uh, he, first of all, was um, a very dedicated freedom fighter. I mean, that, that's well known. But uh, it, speaking to his um, uh, interpreter in Algeria, who's still alive, uh, speaking to him, it, it occurs to me that the man uh, at the age of 43 was not only charismatic, uh, not only um, uh, very, very, very well read, particularly in the... Um, in the writings of uh, revolu revolutionary leaders and commander guerrilla leaders, um, he was uh, also very, very smart. Very smart. I mean, he was obviously he he was he was a great orator, but he was also um, it wasn't it wasn't fluff. It wasn't he wasn't a windbag. <laughs> he was obviously he had a, a really you know a, a, a brain which was you know like a steel trap. Um, it, it was you know it was. Uh, a very, very formidable um, uh, weapon that he could use, his brains. The premise of the film started uh, with a, a conversation that took place uh, in South Africa House. Um, Lord Joffe, as you know, was the attorney at the Ravonia trial, defending um, Nelson Mandela. Um, uh, and. Um, he said uh, over dinner, do you know the story about, um, uh, about Mandela's gun? And my producer uh, and uh, Claire Evans and I, no, we don't know about that. Tell us about it. So he told us the story of how when he came back to Lily's Leaf, and we were at a fundraiser for Lily's Leaf that night, um, uh, he, when Mandela came back from Ethiopia, came back, got back into the country, he went to Lily's Leaf and buried uh, the weapon, the Makarov pistol, in, uh, in the garden. 
And when he came out of uh, 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 prison, he went to the house, uh, which had been you know, made into a museum and a heritage site, uh, and undergone certain changes. But he went back and he said, did anyone find, um, find my weapon, which I buried here before, just before I went to uh, Durban uh, to meet Utuli. And um, uh, Alistair Sparks, who was with him, said, no, I don't think so. And I don't think anyone's found that. So he measured it and they started digging, um, looking for the weapon under the direction, mostly, of, of um, you know, um, Walpies, Harold Walpies' son. And they never found it. But, so we heard about this and we volunteered to, to help because we had connections, contacts. Um, and we introduced some very uh, um, specialized uh, equipment and um, introduced a, a, a man who was uh, extremely experienced in forensic investigations. And we tried to find it. And that, we thought that, that would be the film, a, little, you know, a small television documentary aimed, targeted at uh, the History Channel or possibly National Geographic. Uh, we didn't find it. Uh, it occurred to me that it was probably a bigger story. So I said, why don't we go to Ethiopia and find out more about the training there? And why, why and, and, and what circumstances? He was handed a Russian Makarov because Ethiopia at that time was uh, aligned mostly to the, to the West and to, I was, you know, they had Israeli advisors there. So I thought, well, there's something not quite right here. Um, there's a discordance. And we went to uh, the, um, uh, Ethiopia and we discovered uh, that while he was there, one of his bodyguards had been hired to commission to kill him. Um, and the story really took off from there because I said, well, we've got a, there's, there's a much bigger story here. Very, very flattering. They were, uh, they were impressed by his physical strength. Um, they thought he was, you know, he was, mind you, he was 40, 42, 43. Um, so he, he, by the standards of the recruits he was training with, I mean, he was at the police barracks in, outside Addis. Um, so, but he had, so he had to keep up with um, a lot of very fit young men. So, but they were impressed by his strength. They were impressed by his, um, his character, his dedication. And again, by his, you know, his, uh, his reading and his, and his, uh, his, I think, um, his passion. I think there's no doubt that uh, everyone was affected by his commitment. I think the audience will leave the cinema or turn off their televisions or close their laptops and say, there was a man. I think what we've done is actually given him more, f I think they've given Madiba more flesh and blood. We've given him um, something more, more human.